uh, my uh, subject, my title is The UN Position Israel's and Israel's Security Fence, a Tragedy Comedy in Three Acts. The first act was the resolution of the General Assembly to request an advisory opinion on the legality of the, quote, wall being constructed by Israel, even though the General Assembly had already decided in a previous resolution, one, that it is illegal, and two, that it must be dismantled. The second act focuses on the court the court's refusal to recuse a judge who had clearly indicated his anti-Israel balance on the question before the court long in various ways that I'll get to, the court's assertion of advisory jurisdiction in what was clearly a contentious case involving Israel without Israel's consent purportedly justified on the ground that the decision would not be binding on Israel, yet ruling in its conclusion, quote, a legal obligation to do various things in the, uh, as it progressed, and again, I will read you some of those. The decision on the merits itself is open to criticism on a number of grounds, but the most outrageous aspect is the denial of Israel's right to self-defense against Palestinian attacks. And the court did this based on a novel and totally unsupported interpretation of Article 51, limiting the right to self-defense to attacks by, quote, other states. Since the Palestinians are not a state, Israel has no right to self-defense. The third act was the General Assembly's demand in a subsequent resolution that Israel comply with the decision of the court, even though the court itself had indicated that the decision was not binding on Israel. I will try to elaborate a little bit on each of those points to the extent my limited time permits. First, the General Assembly's resolution requesting an advisory opinion. On December 8, 2003, at a meeting of the 10th Emergency Special Session, the General Assembly adopted a resolution which requested the ICJ to, quote, urgently render an advisory opinion on the following question. And let me read you the question. What are the legal consequences arising from the construction of the wall being built by Israel, the occupying power, in the occupied Palestinian territory, including and around East Jerusalem? The designation of Israel as the occupying power and the territory in question as occupied Palestinian territory prejudges the answer to fundamental questions that are at the heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The assertion that the territories are Palestinian is wrong both historically and legally. The territory is not and never was Palestinian. Indeed, from the time that the Roman Empire captured the territory some 2,000 years ago and renamed it Palestine to obliterate any connection with the Jewish people, to the present, there has never been a Palestinian state in that territory. Nor can the Assembly's reference to Palestinian territory be justified on the ground that even though the territory was never historically Palestinian, it is legally Palestinian. The General Assembly resolution recommending partition was exactly that, a recommendation. As most of you know, the Arab states rejected the recommendation both verbally and by the use of force. Moreover, the, the Charter does not authorize the General Assembly to adopt binding resolutions. Only the Security Council can do so. And the Security Council has never adopted a resolution allocating the territory to the Palestinians. On the contrary, Resolution 242 
adopted by the Security Council in 1967, after Israel captured Judea and Samaria, the West Bank provides, quote, the fulfillment of charter principles requires the establishment of a just and lasting peace in the Middle East, which should include the application of the following principles withdrawal of Israeli armed forces from territories occupied in the recent conflict, termination of all claims of belligerency, and respect for and acknowledgement of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and political independence of every state in the area, and their right to live in peace with insecure and recognized boundaries free from threats or use of force. Note, this nowhere even refers to a Palestinian state, nor did the drafters of Resolution 242 uh, uh, make any such claims. In fact, the resolution was opposed by Syria and the Soviet Union, which, which demanded that Israel be required to withdraw from all the territories. And as you all probably know and have read, the word the territories, even the word the was omitted to indicate, and uh, Ambassador Goldberg, who was then U.S. representative to the U.N., had written in the New York Times about it, that there was no uh, consensus that Israel would have to withdraw from all the territories, and that's why they uh, left the word the out even. And while legal scholars disagree on Israel's right to retain these territories, a number of prominent scholars have taken the position that Israel has a legal right to remain in the territories until the parties negotiate an agreement. Such prominent jurists as Stephen Schwebel, the former president of the International Court of Justice, Rosalind Higgins, a judge now on the court, as well as Eugene Rastow, former dean of Yale Law School and undersecretary of the United States, have all have all written that until such time as the parties negotiate a settlement in accordance with Resolution 242, Israel has a legal right to remain in the territories. Israel also has cl tenable claims to these territories on historical and religious ties to the territories based on the League of Nations mandate and on its capture of these territories in a war of self-defense. Uh, I won't go into all these arguments, though I've done so elsewhere, but whatever one's views on Israel's right to the territory, the question is clearly complex, controversial, and one on which the court had not ruled. Had the General Assembly been interested in an objective legal opinion from the ICJ, it would have used a neutral term, such as disputed territories, administered territories, an allocated territory, or referred to it by its name. Its reference to the territory as occupied Palestinian territory and to Israel as the occupying power belie any interest in an objective legal opinion. Second, was this an appropriate question for an advisory opinion? The International Court of Justice has two kinds of jurisdiction contentious under Article 36, and advisory under Article 65. Contentious jurisdiction depends on the consent of the parties, either by a declaration filed in advance or in a particular case. Obviously, they could not get contentious jurisdiction in this case because Israel had not consented. Article, 30, Article 65 provides that the court, quote, may give an advisory opinion on any legal question at the request of whatever body may be authorized by or in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations to make such a request. The purpose of an advisory opinion is to give legal guidance to help the organ or agency of the UN that requests it to determine what action to take. But the General Assembly had already taken the position that the wall is a violation of international law and that Israel must, quote, stop and reverse the construction in a resolution that it adopted several weeks before the resolution requesting the advisory opinion. 